Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, I'm ready to begin. Uh, we're honored today to have uh, Professor Clay Reed from the Harvard Medical School with us, um, visiting the, the area. Uh, he'll also be speaking at the Allen Brain Institute, I think, uh, a little later. Um, we've known Clay for, for a number of years. Um, um, MSR has, has sponsored a portion of his research. We're very excited about the direction he's going in, both in terms of the visualization uh, technologies and graphics and rendering, as well as the um, electrophysiological uh, direction. Um, he's um, been working um, for a number of years on visual perception um, and like, like many people in that field, um, start out by looking at, or started out by looking at unit activity, single poking glass electrodes into single uh, neurons and listening to them popping. Uh, I've done that myself uh, all the way up to grad school and um, I have to say that uh, after a while you go from the confidence of saying to yourself, I am somewhere amidst thought, to I want to know more about the circuits and technology uh, underlying the magic of mind. And um, Clay's team has had the uh, wonderful uh, opportunity to um, apply some, some late-breaking technologies in FRET to voltage-sensitive dyes uh, and other kinds of, of, of techniques for tracing connectivity um, in vertebrate brain and we'll be hearing more about this evolving area that he's been his team has been referring to as connectomics today. So, Clay, come on up, and we'll be hearing about functional connectomics of neural networks. Thanks very much, Eric. Um, nice to be here. Um, I want to tell you today about um, two kinds of research that we've been doing, and. Uh, one of them has been very uh, kindly and generously supported by Microsoft, uh, the second word in, in the title. Uh, so the title is Functional Connectomics of Neural Networks, which is a, a mouthful, but it's becoming the title to use if you want it to come up on search terms. Connectomics is uh, a word sort of simultaneously coined by Jeff Lichtman's group and also by uh, an MRI group uh, in Switzerland. And it's uh, omics because everything in biology needs to be omics if it's going to be anything in the 21st century and implying uh, completeness or large scaleness. Uh, connectomics is um, uh, at least someday will be the complete, but certainly now is the large-scale study of connections in the brain. Um, I'll be telling you about uh, actually one of the very first studies uh, in connectomics at the level of single neurons that we just uh, finished uh, last year. And we combined it. It wasn't just a, an anatomy project or a project looking at the connections in neural networks, but also a physiology uh, research program, and hence the word function, functional connectomics. Um, and it's important from the very beginning to emphasize that there are two kinds of data that I'll be talking about, and they're complementary, but they're, they're, they're very separate, and it's important to, 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 in sort of reasoning about the data, to, to keep them separate in your mind. The first one, functional, is on the left, and uh, I'll be telling you more about what images like this mean, but it's, uh, I'll spend a minute or two on the very first slide. Uh, first to say that it's a, a picture, a couple hundred microns by a couple hundred microns. It's uh, the width of several human hairs, uh, and it's looking into the living brain of a mouse and the living brain of a mouse as the mouse is looking at a computer monitor and we're watching essentially its brain see. And I'll show you a movie or two of the neurons in a living mouse's brain seeing, but this is a, a false color picture 
which indicates the various flavors of, of visual neurons in this part of uh, the mouse brain in the, in the visual cortex. And uh, in this part of the brain, uh, neurons see a, a particular <laughs> position in visual space, but they're fairly picky, fairly selective about the different kinds of stimuli that excite these neurons. And in particular, they care about the orientation of the stimulus that you can show a vertical bar to some neurons and, and those neurons will file, fire away. Uh, but you show a horizontal bar to the same neuron and they won't fire at all. So it's, it's a, when in engineering terms or computer vision terms, they're, they're filters, they're, they're image filters and they're oriented filters. Um, in mouse brain, you say don't fire at all. Do you, do you tend to see that kind of, of stark binary uh, response or do you have neurons that are maybe like into sort of a, a Poisson firing background state and when you give them a stimulus they go into it much, they, they shift that. Most cortical neurons are pretty quiet. Uh, really? Baseline. So you'll see, actually, uh, you'll see some movies of, you know, th th so they're, they're firing a bit, but they, they will fire 10 times uh, faster when the appropriate stimulus comes on. Some neurons are absolutely quiet until, uh, until the right thing happens. And then it really is, it's not binary, it's a graded tuning curve, but they'll do nothing to, to horizontal stimuli and will fire away to vertical stimuli. I often like showing movies from the 60s or 70s uh, from Hubel and Wiesel who really started this field, uh, first at Hopkins and then at Harvard. There are actual movies of uh, visual stimuli that are being presented to an animal and you can listen to the neurons. Uh, but it really is, in that case, it's a very binary. Vertical bar, you hear click, 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 the neuron fires, horizontal, absolutely nothing. So here we have the color code, and you can see it in the lower left-hand corner, I have lost my mouse. No, that's, uh, anyway, there's my mouse. Uh, here's the color code that vertical neurons are green, vertical meaning they're not vertical in the brain, but when they see a vertical stimulus, they fire away. Uh, uh, the red neurons respond to horizontal stimuli. And what's interesting about the mouse brain is these neurons that do very different things can be, are all mixed up together. So you'll, I'll talk about these two neurons pretty soon. Uh, uh, a red and a green neuron, those are neurons that rarely fire at the same time, but they're right next to each other and they're seeing different things. And on the right, uh, this is the connectomics part. Uh, and just a preview of what that's about is it's very, very large scale data at the, at the nanoscale uh, from electron microscopy that allow us to trace the connections densely in a neural circuit. And uh, the, uh, currently, um, our first data set is in the 10 teravoxel, uh, 10 terapixel, but in three dimensions. Uh, range, so you know, 10 to the 13 data points in, in the, the data set. And it's a very, very big image processing and image analysis problem that we uh, started out with, with uh, significant help from here, Michael Cohn and, and his people. Um, so back to, on the left, the, the functional part. And again, I've pointed out these two neurons here that do very different things. and. Uh, so this is large-scale physiology, able to look at many neurons at once, but wouldn't it be great to have large-scale anatomy as well, being able to zoom at these, into these little points, and these neurons are 10, 10 microns across, but wouldn't it be great to, to zoom in all the way to see every single anatomical detail about these given neurons, and that's what we've done over the past five years. Uh, I have a question on that picture on the left. So are we looking at sampling of neurons with those responsive, responsivities, or are we looking at all? We are looking at uh, roughly 100 neurons that just happen to be in the field of view of our microscope at a given time. Uh, probably 60 of, or 70 of them are colored, meaning that they were quite responsive to our stimuli. But these hundreds, of, this 100 neurons was embedded in a network of, say, 10,000 neurons. And we can... So why are these lit up? What I'm saying is, is, is several different explanations, right? Our dyes just hit the, yeah. and these were in focus, or, you know, we're actually, we're actually yeah. seeing... I'll get to that, but uh, the, the simple answer is all the neurons can be lit up. The, the, the dye, the, the, these are fluorescent dyes that we put into the brain, sometimes with chemicals, sometimes with genetically encoded 
genes that are fluorescent, uh, all of them light up. And we can study, in this case, 100 at a time. Some, we, uh, we've gone up to more than 1,000 at a time and perhaps pushing 10,000 in the very best experiment. Um, so wouldn't it be great to zoom in? And yes, it was, but it was pretty hard. <laughs> this is just a tiny fraction. Sorry, I keep pointing and then advancing. A tiny fraction of our 10 terabyte data set just showing the cell bodies of those two neurons that do very different things. And so the, the, this story is about large-scale anatomy. It's called serial section electron microscopy, and I'll unpack that in, in 10 minutes or so. And what it gives us is every axon, every dendrite, every wire in a, in a, a given part of the brain, and every synapse, every connection between those wires. And uh, First and foremost, it's important to say this is an infinitely big or you know, a very big data set, and it's impossible by any means to sample it or densely to, to really analyze it all. But with, with well-posed questions, we can uh, go in and answer some simple questions that couldn't have been addressed with other means. So here's what people still do, but you know, have historically done to look at neural networks. This is probably the most uh, neuroscience slide uh, in the talk. Uh, and the classic approach is called stick and stain. Where stick means you take a tiny little electrode, or in this case, I wonder if the lights can be turned down in front. Uh, it's probably better on, the, on TV. Uh, uh, on the left is a picture of brain that you can't really see very much, but there, there are six uh, electrodes, tiny, tiny little glass electrodes that are, uh, well done, uh, that are poking into six neurons at a time. And I won't show you that kind of data, but it's electrical uh, data. And on the right, from the same six neurons, uh, uh, the, the same neuroscientists look at the anatomy. This, this is, on the right, six different neurons that they can correlate what they learn from listening in on the neurons and then the connections that they could in infer from listening in on the neurons and then correlating that with anatomy. And f from deep neuroscience, let me just go to simple matrices. From this lovely study, uh, uh, just a couple years ago, but there are many like it, uh, it outlined uh, a matrix representation of the cortical computation. The cortex is a six-layered structure where neurons can live in different layers and they talk from one layer to another. It's really a, a hierarchical neural net, literally. Uh, and there's an in, there are input cells uh, and output cells. You know, one, one neuron talks in a directional manner to another neuron. So you can do, just represent the cortical computation or the cortical network by this matrix. And um, this is very importantly, it's, it's not a wiring diagram of, bra of the brain. It's a blockwise wiring diagram. It's, it's like the, the, uh, a diagram of the connections between parts on a, on a, a computer chip. You know, the CPU talks to uh, whenever it talks to and listens to the memory, <laughs> talks back and forth to the memory, et cetera. But it's, it's, and for that reason, it's a statistical model of, of the connections. You can say that, for instance, there's a very strong connection in the hierarchical neural network from layer four to layer two, three, not important what they are. Uh, and that's represented by that uh, circle and that line. Uh, in, in the graph. But that doesn't say they're all connected. It, it, in, in fact, uh, uh, the data say that 10% of the neurons are connected. So it's statistical. It really doesn't give the, the logical structure of the computation. Same thing in the hierarchy, 2, 3 talks to layer 5. Very importantly, and those are feed-forward connections, very importantly, it's a recurrent neural network where layer 4, the input layer, talks to itself. And that, again, is not all to all, but some to some, and, this, and that's the thing I'm interested in, that many of us are interested in. What's the nature of the, the, the fine scale wiring diagram? One second. And then finally, 2 3 talks to 2 3. So, sorry, I didn't understand. So, this is structural or functional that they used to derive? This is structural, which told them where the neurons were, but they could have figured it out without doing the anatomy very carefully. 
and functional, meaning they listened in to the neurons and made one neuron fire and listened in on another neuron to see if it, it heard that neuron. So it's, it's really putting together physiological data inferring wires. So it's, not, it's, it's, it's actually not uh, showing the connections, but it's, it's, it's sort of uh, a very good indication that these neurons are physically connected. That's why this paper is so lovely. You, know, the, you, you could get this from the literature, but this was thousands and thousands of pairs of neurons in a very circumscribed circuit that they just did the same experiment over and over again beautifully. And so this is the, you know, if you want to go to one paper in the literature to get the structure of <laughs> cortical networks, I think this is where I would go. And this um, might be pushing too fast from the, the chip to the the operating system, but what, what do they say from this kind of, which is very interesting, this kind of, a, these kind of results about what this all means in terms of, besides just this, about, about the circuits or functionality of these, of these layers? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, yeah, they don't really, because, you know, this, this is not news. This is 40 years old, or if, if not 100 years old, but, you know, uh, so it's confirmation of the outline that we've really known for quite some time. And, you know, if I can say anything, wh how do you go from this common knowledge to knowing how the whole thing works? And the answer is, for me, you don't. You just don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's just a statistical sampling of connections. But that, you know, a computer is not a statistical machine to first approximation. And, you know, we can discuss that, whether a brain might be, but I think not. Um, so, again, I've made the point many times blockwise. But wouldn't it be great to uh, zoom in to the cell level, and that's what I want to talk about today, to take just one local network, say the, the layer two, three local network, and draw the matrix of that. And th this is from a nice review. Uh, just recent, last month in Nature, uh, we, we had a paper, and Winfried Denk's had a similar, uh, Winfried Denk in Heidelberg's, a group had a similar paper. Ours was in the cerebral cortex, theirs was in the retina. This is from a nice review from Winfried Denk, just uh, illustrating what one would mean by a local network. And it's pretty obvious that on the left we have uh, a physical representation uh, or a semi-physical representation of each node is a neuron where it exists in the brain and each line is a connection between those neurons. Uh, uh, but it's sort of easier to think about it in terms of a graph. And, and a dominant model, it's becoming less dominant, but, but still an important model out there, is that cortical networks are random. And if one had a, a wiring diagram of a local cortical network that was random, then no matter how you uh, shuffle around the matrix, it'll look like this. It'll, it'll look totally unstructured. Uh, and of course, that's something, you know, it's a nice straw man. Uh, it's a nice uh, null hypothesis. One very simple, different kind of model is just cell assemblies you, you could postulate. And this is sort of the uh, kind of model I'll be talking about. And I don't mean to push it too strongly, but it's a nice way of organizing thinking. You can imagine that there are two flavors of neurons, red and blue, that are totally mixed together. And I hope you remember back to the first data slide where four colors of neurons were totally mixed together. You can imagine that those neurons are mixed together and the red talk to the red, the blue talk to the blue, but there's very little crosstalk. And that's the kind of thing, there's a bit of uh, indication of that in the literature, but really just a bit. It's not, uh, we don't know that. And we certainly, even if we did know that, we don't know how that relates to processing in a cortical network. So this is something, you know, it's an important slide. Uh, imagine the two uh, simple extremes, a, a random cortical network and a blockwise uh, disjoint uh, cortical network where there are cliques of neurons that talk to their own clique, but not, not a neighboring or an intercalated clique of neurons. So this is just beating a dead horse, but imagine that there are cell assemblies of red and uh, blue neurons. And uh, it's important to emphasize that in the first kind of experiment that I showed you, or the, the stick and stain experiment, uh, the kind of model I'm showing here is uh, considering a population of neurons where in most 
neuroscience experiments, they would be identical neurons. There'd be a thousand copies of, of biologically identical neurons. And the question is, are those biologically identi identical neurons, excitatory neurons in this case, do they have disjoint cliques? And they might do different things. They might just tend to fire together. So, you know, a uh, saying in neuroscience, neuro neurons that fire together, wire together. You can imagine sets of neurons that fire together over the course of an animal's life. They uh, could very likely be more connected to themselves, you know, an ensemble of synchronous neurons. Okay, computer analogy. It's kind of a nice one. It's something that uh, uh, Tony Hay back in, in the day, uh, when we were just starting on this project, uh, uh, Jeff Lichtman's group at Harvard College and, and my group, uh, we got a grant from MSR and Tony Hay did a, a, just a visit, a site visit, but really just a, a visit. And Jeff and I gave some talks. And I put together these slides for Tony, and I, I, I like them. So whenever I talk to a computer crowd or even any crowd, I, I show them. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, imagine figuring out how a computer works. And this is the first computer, the, you know, one, one of the first, or if not the first electronic computer. Uh, Colossus at Bletchley Park uh, that was used, uh, among other things, to, to crack the Enigma codes during World War I. And like old computers, uh, uh, it has a light panel that shows the instantaneous state of at least part of the state machine that is the computer. And you can look in that if, if you know this computer, or even if you can uh, look carefully, you can see there are banks of five. You can imagine it's some kind of decimal operation and, and go from there. Um, so given that one is confronted with Colossus, what, what, which was used to reverse engineer Enigma, how would you reverse engineer Colossus? And you, you have this functional imaging. On, on the one hand, the, the, the snapshot of the state machine at each time point. But of course, uh, you'd really figure it out only or, uh, by making a wiring diagram. And this is the decimal logic, or a bit of the decimal logic of this computer. What I like about the, this picture that I found, in, or the movie that I found on YouTube, is it, it really reminded me of what we do every day in my physiology lab, which is look at neurons in the living brain. And this is something uh, from a, a Mark Anderman and Aaron Curlin in my lab, a student and postdoc, postdoc and student. And this is, this is actually spontaneous activity. This is a mouse just thinking. <laughs> and it might be seeing something, too. It wasn't a very controlled experiment. But those flashes are bursts of action potentials of uh, you know, order 100 neurons. And you can see some of them fire a lot. Some of them that you can't see might not be firing at all. But it's just thinking away. And that's a snapshot of the state machine that's the cortical network. But of course, wouldn't it be great, I've said that three times or four times already, uh, to have a wiring diagram. And this is the uh, not much of a wiring diagram. It's not a decimal logic circuit. But it's, it's the punchline of our recent paper. And the punchline of our recent paper is that for some neurons, inhibitory neurons, and I'll get to what those inhibitory neurons are later on, uh, they uh, we found that those inhibitory neurons can get input from all different colors of neurons, all different functions of excitatory neurons. So it's something that doesn't respect the cliques of, of cortical networks. That's probably in code to, to everyone here and everyone who's watching on TV, but I'll, I'll explain it later. Um, so how can we demonstrate the functional assemblies in the cortex? And that's with two-photon calcium imaging. On the right, we have a a uh, 300 micron cube of neurons in the living, this is a, a rat brain, uh, and uh, there are thousands of little points of light, which is literally every single neuron in that cube of, of cortex, and most of the glia as well, light up with, with our calcium indicator that gets brighter when the neurons are active. Uh, so it's roughly 3,000 cells. We sample usually one slice through the, those cells at a time, and it's a simple experiment. We label with the calcium indicators. We image with a fancy laser scanning microscope. We excite with visual stimuli. And that's the important part. We, we are, do a visual physiology experiment where we see what the neurons are doing right now and really do for a living in the, in the, the living brain. And then we just watch the, the neurons respond. And 
resolution are you seeing in terms of time resolution? Of the yeah, so, so the, the movie I showed earlier was 16 frames per second. What I won't show in this talk, but probably would interest you, is we've, and I'll t I can show you later, uh, we've built a, a video rate, 30 hertz uh, microscope, where we, where we can really have, we can see bursts of action potentials, or even single, sometimes, action yeah, that's, potentials, that's, that's what I'm at 30 millisecond resolution. So, uh, so, so typically what we're seeing here is um, the result of bursts that, that, that change the voltage of the whole cell. We're seeing the, the, the averaging of that. Yeah. On. Yeah, so it's a calcium signal, which is slightly slower, so that, that slows you down a bit. But in the, in the very fastest scopes, it's a trade-off. These are scanning microscopes, so it's a trade-off on resolution and, and, uh, and image size and speed. But people are pushing a handful of milliseconds, so it's almost, it's getting almost as good as electrode recordings, which is kind of exciting. It's a really, everything I'm telling you about has no dynamical component to speak of, but one is beginning to do dynamics with these recordings. This is an old experiment just showing, I won't even explain what's going on, but you can see on the upper right-hand corner the visual stimulus going, and the rest is roughly 100 neurons again that are flashing away in response to the stimuli. Just, just the, the, the flashes here are not actual potential flashes. Yeah. The, no, they're, they're basically, we're seeing changes in the rate of firing, and that, that leads to a, a lowering of the, or, or a raising of the calcium. calcium level. Yeah, so, so this is, there are a lot of, what, what, what would one want? One would, would want uh, electrical recordings from all of these neurons, and the time scale is roughly a millisecond, a bit faster, and then you really get cortical dynamics. What do we have? We have imaging, which is great. <laughs> so that, that's, I'm not giving that away. Uh, this, this movie was made at one hertz or even less. So it, that, this is just showing the average firing rate over the past second. Uh, one will have uh, not a millisecond, but say 10 milliseconds as sort of the bread and butter imaging soon. And that's good enough to do a lot of dynamics. It's, it's really, it's exciting that this essentially an anatomical technique started off giving us some average function over, over a long time period from neural standpoints, but now is really approaching the uh, speed and even the signal to noise, in, seeing single spikes, uh, spikes being an action potential, you know, neurons firing of cortical neurons, and hundreds if not thousands at a time. You've been waiting. Uh, uh, I was wondering about the, the image that you're showing to the animal. Why, why isn't the image a little bit more complex than this? Why, why aren't you uh, trying different bars in different parts of the image or trying to see if yeah. different parts of the brain react to different parts of the image and so on? Uh, yeah. It seems like this. This is the a very very. This is what we started with. This and this is the the standard easiest thing you can do if you have bad signal to noise. I took it out of the slide pack, but but at the end, I ask me at the end and if if there's any time and I can show much more interesting stimuli and really getting interesting you know aspects of the visual responses. It's a great question. This is just the the tip of the iceberg of, of the block letter what the neuron does, but it's not, it's not all that a neuron does by any means. Uh, you know, we have to, we have to new. Yeah. And if we have to, people get to the end of the discussion mode, so you should, should yeah. worry about that. Yeah, no, but I'm, I'm getting concerned already, so, <laughs> yeah, and I even knew that, so I, I'm not going to show so, that yet, but at the end, ask me, and I, I will I gladly show that. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so um, that, that when you go to um, uh, diagonal um, facing, I guess, southwest, there's a big bright flash across the. Yeah. Is that artifact or is that for real? That's all for real. Uh, so that's we're we looking at neurons underneath it. Uh, oh, that's yeah. Uh, the the flat the background flash yeah. is neuropil. It's it's the the axons and dendrites that we don't have the resolution to see. It's so like the milky would, uh, it's getting much better. <laughs> so we actually can see dendrites. This this is the old days. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but so the so this is a, a method to see cell bodies and their average firing rate. It doesn't see all the, the filigree and all the, the wires, but it's getting there. Uh, and and this, this is, uh, uh, I, I won't even describe what this is, because, but there are details that. Right, but, uh, but are you limited mostly to surface work, work right now? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, here, I did go too fast. This is, uh, in the upper right-hand corner, is a cube. Uh, uh, that goes from the surface of the brain 300 microns deep, and we take a, a tangential optical slice uh, 
So it's, a, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an optical sectioning technique that allows one to, to focus just on a thin layer uh, and ignore everything above and below. And we can go down a half a millimeter now, which in the mouse gets us to the input layer, layer four, which is exciting. But this, yeah, it's a three-dimensional uh, kind of microscopy that we typically do with two-dimensional slice at any given time. But we sample over three dimensions in most experiments. Okay, so let me go more background, mouse visual cortex, I've already said it. Neurons that do different things are mixed together. So let's go back to remembering that, that neurons that do different things are mixed together. So you can, these are functional cliques, and the question is, are, what's the wiring of these different groups? Uh, and last sort of introduction slide, but I've said it a hundred times so far. We have functional imaging that tells what uh, cells do and how are they wired, which is the next part of the talk, with three-dimensional electron microscopy. And uh, uh, until I started putting this sentence right now, uh, people would pepper me with questions about how would you possibly reconstruct one brain where we all know or we, we all can imagine that every brain must be different, that they, the, there's no way that, that genes give the exact wiring diagram the same way of each brain. So every brain is different, but what we're looking for is not the, the details of a fingerprint, but the uh, rules, and I, I like to keep two things separate, rules, which, uh, rules and motifs, rules which really relate function to whether neurons are uh, connected to each other, and motifs really more from network or graph theory, uh, uh, um, motifs <laughs> of, of, of interconnected networks. So, Here's the, uh, you can imagine that my favorite question is, are green cells connected to green, red to red? We didn't answer that question in the first study uh, because we didn't have, we only had 10 terabytes of data and we needed a bit more. So uh, we, we were lucky enough that with our data set, we, we could give a pretty good answer to a different question about the excitatory input to inhibitory cells. So cortical neurons, um, all neurons really come in two flavors neurons that excite other neurons and neurons that inhibit other neurons. Uh, the excitatory neurons in visual cortex are very well tuned for different orientations. The inhibitory neurons are much less well tuned. It's a controversial topic, but it's, it's uh, becoming clear that uh, most, if not, well, most inhibitory cells really don't care about the, the orientation of a stimulus. And that would predict a model where the inhibitory cells really wouldn't care about what color, what, what orientation preference of excitatory neurons I listen to. And that's exactly the kind of, exactly the question we, we were able to look at in this first study. Uh, I always run out of time, so it's nice to put the names of all the people who've done the work actually uh, in the middle. And to, to say two things, one is that, that I did this work in two labs, one at Harvard Medical School, my main lab, uh, and that's where the, the team that started and continues this, uh, this functional imaging, this calcium imaging, uh, again, the imaging of, of changes in calcium as, which reflect the changes of firing. And this whole effort was started by just a wonderful postdoc who's gone on. He's now uh, went straight from postdoc to full professor and chair of, of uh, Kyushu Medical School, the anatomy department at Kyushu uh, Medical School in Japan. That's Kenichi Yoki, uh, a bunch of other people whose work I won't talk about, uh, uh, who did the first studies, and then Aaron Curlin and Mark Anderman, whose work I will talk about. Uh, their work went into this uh, first study. Uh, funding sources, NIH, uh, NINDS, and uh, uh, for, for the work I won't tell you about, uh, the FAST imaging, uh, a grant also from Microsoft Research. Um, this is my lab. Uh, Mark Anderman and Aaron Curlin did the physiology for the experiment I'll tell you about today. Uh, Davi Bach and Wei Chung Lee did the large scale anatomy. Uh, Davi, was a, this was his thesis project, and he went on, he started his own group at Janelia Farm, uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Janelia Farm, a few months ago. And Wei Chung Lee is still a postdoc in my lab, continuing this work. This is the EM team. Here are all of our friends and colleagues who worked with a large-scale uh, electron microscopy. It started in Cambridge uh, in, in a 
uh, the Connectome project at the Center for Brain Science that Jeff Lichtman started and uh, raised a lot of money for and we, we worked sort of side by side for a number of years on this project until I moved the project uh, to uh, my uh, uh, main lab at the medical school. Uh, Davi Bach and Wei Chung Li did all the work and we have a lot of computer collaborators really starting with, with uh, uh, collaboration and funding from Microsoft Research that really allowed this project to happen. So uh, uh, the, it, it was uh, at a very early stage in, in this project. The NIH wouldn't have even thought of, of funding it. Uh, but Microsoft Research was very generous in, in giving us support to do really the, uh, the computer infrastructure of this project and funded uh, the salaries of Davi Bach and Wei Chung Li. And also we had a, a really a proof of principle collaboration with Michael Cohen and his HDView group. Um, the, the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center, uh, Art Wetzel and Greg Hood, uh, did the, the, the difficult computer work of, of the aligning of the, the tens of terabytes of image data into a three-dimensional volume. I'll tell you about that. So, Experiment. What did we do? We, we did uh, a very standard functional experiment, first thing, uh, something that we do uh, all the time in our lab. Again, I've shown you exactly this picture a number of times. Uh, then we did an anatomy experiment, and we wish we could have done an anatomy experiment over all of these neurons, the entire 300 micron extent of all these neurons. Uh, we just, we in uh, the entire uh, community who's doing this, four or five labs who are doing this worldwide, can't do a data set that big yet. So we did what we could do, which is a 50 micron slab of anatomy. Uh, if I have, there we go. Uh, it's easy to do two dimensions. Uh, each picture is a very large two-dimensional electron micrograph. It's very hard to do the third dimension. The third dimension is sliver after sliver after sliver of, of brain uh, and building that up into a three-dimensional volume. And uh, we, we could do 1,100 slivers, but we couldn't do 5,000 slivers. So the short dimension, which I've been trying to point to, but you can see the short dimension only included uh, a small number, you know, 10, 15, of the functionally characterized cells. This is orienting you in brain space and in the brain of, of what we imaged first in vivo and then with the large scale anatomy. In vivo, it, it, again, it each we label with these calcium indicators uh, a sphere of, of cells, uh, thousands of cells. And also in these experiments, we used a trick where we filled the blood vessels with a red dye. And that, you'll see why, how important that is in order to look at the living brain data and correspond it with the, the anatomical data a year, two years later. And we use the, the blood vessels, which you can just see in red, as, as the, the roadmap to, to, to show us where uh, we were within the brain. Uh, we slice the brain up in very, very thin, 50 nanometer thin sections. And we, we sliced it in, in a different dimension. Uh, we, uh, when you do the physiology, you, you do a tangential section through the brain and get uh, neurons in a sort of pancake looking down. The, the, the cortex is really uh, organized radially from surface down. So you really want to do anatomy in, the, in a coronal or a, a radial plane where, so I'm just re-slicing the, 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 the data from the living brain where we have the blood vessels, very important, the red blood vessels, the green dots, which are individual neurons that are labeled with a calcium indicator, the physiology plane, uh, meaning we, we collected functional data from just one layer of cells, and that was the, the saddest scientific decision I've ever made <laughs> that you know, we did. This is one experiment we spent the past five years getting setting up to do, but the past two and a half years doing this one experiment. And we had a number of indications that the, 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 the anatomy wasn't very good, and we were afraid that we were zapping the brain with too much laser power. So in this one experiment that we didn't know it was going to be the one, we pulled back uh, on the laser power and only imaged one plane of physiology. 
And the experiment would have been radically better if we had imaged four or eight planes, which we could have done and will obviously do in the next experiment. Uh, we sliced up that brain in sort of neural and anatomical uh, techniques that I don't need to bore you with other than to say that it's a cookbook method taking a, a physical brain, embedding it in plastic, and uh, labeling mostly the membranes, uh, the cell membranes and, and some of the proteins with heavy metals. And that's the heavy metals provide the, the contrast, the color, with electron microscopy. So we sliced up the brain this way. And this, this slide may or may not uh, make sense, but it, it just shows that all this work had a significant handiwork component. Uh, Wei Cheng Li, the, the postdoc, spent a month, maybe two months of his life, taking this cube of brain and slicing one 50 nanometer or 40 nanometer section after another, picking it up by hand on essentially uh, another 50 nanometer thick uh, trampoline that's uh, suspended in a three millimeter, uh, so it was like a penny. The, each, each one of these uh, circles is like a very small, thin penny that has, has a hole in it. In the middle of that hole is a 50 nanometer thick plastic trampoline, essentially, a membrane that way by hand picked up section after section uh, that we needed to do the three-dimensional uh, thing, uh, three-dimensional reconstruction. Uh, thousands of them. He actually did 3,000 of them, but we couldn't image them all. And because he was a fallible human being, <laughs> he dropped two. And, you know, it was shocking. Uh, uh, a few more were lost uh, in the imaging process. But we had 98% uh, of, of the sections that we got through the entire pipeline to make crazy big pictures like this. And I guess this isn't a crazy big picture here. I, you know, uh, we uh, early on. Five years ago, <laughs> we, we found a like-minded person uh, in Michael Cohn who liked making gigavox, gigapixel pictures. This is a gigapixel picture of brain where that's it's exactly the same as what the picture you saw before. A cortical surface, the cell bodies are little white things that you can barely see there. The blood vessels are little very white things, empty places uh, that you can see there. Uh, it has roughly 1,500 cells in our entire volume, but we only looked at a fraction of those cells. But here is the, the hard part. It's a, over 100,000 by almost 100,000 pixels wide, thousands of camera images that we had to stitch together. Each section, so 1,100 sections, that physical sliver of brain, uh, was roughly 9 gigapixels, and that was a decently hard problem, stitching it together. Uh, 1,100 sections, that was the very hard part, uh, and those 1,100 sections added up to, to only, you know, significantly, 50 microns slab of brain. The whole thing was 10 terabytes of finished data. The, it was roughly, I think, 30 or 40, maybe 50 terabytes of data, much of which was carved off in the uh, montaging. So we definitely needed very high throughput imaging. Um, and we nonetheless ran the microscope for several months and a lot of post-processing. Uh, but at the end of the post-processing, you have this beautiful sort of unprecedented data set of uh, hundreds of microns of cortical tissue at nanometer resolution. So you can see everything. Uh, you can throw away virtually everything and just do a volume rendering where you can see red blood vessels and blue neurons uh, doesn't really tell you much other than there are the red blood vessels, there are the blue neurons, but it tells you the expanse of what we, what we imaged. Uh, um, but what's of course important is being able to zoom in. That now we have a brain in silico or on, in, on disks uh, where you can zoom in and navigate through the, this very large data set. You, know, you can do some more volume rendering, which just shows these are two cortical pyramidal neurons, two excitatory neurons, and a couple of others in the corners, and some of the axons and dendrites that it just sort of showing the wiring. It's to, it, more than anything, this looks like a, a, a fluorescence light microscopy picture of a brain that 
biologists are comfortable with. But this is the actual data set in some of its glory that, you know, it's a three-dimensional data set of electron microscope pictures. And you might be able to see on the colored face, well, you certainly can see two big things. Those are two neurons. And you can see the little lines uh, pointing up from those neurons. And those are the big part of the dendrites, you know, the, the, the receiving end uh, of the neuron that, that gets connections. Uh, and ag again, it's in three dimensions. So the third dimension uh, on the left is the 1,000 or 1,100 different physical uh, sections that were d put into 3 million pictures. And those 3 million pictures were, were montaged in 2D and registered in 3D to make this a very nice three-dimensional object. So, uh, so most of what's going on in this cube is all this wiring, correct? I think it's 10% is cell bodies or less, and 90% wiring and you know, half and half axons and dendrites, I think, that the dendrites are bigger, but the axons are more numerous. Uh, um, they're, they're, they're larger caliber. Uh, and I'll show in the next slide just sort of a little bit of electron microscopy for people <laughs> who don't look at these things. And, and, uh, the lost segments, the, the, um, it was pretty easy to, to extrapolate. The lost sections hurt us, but it was the least of our troubles. And with, with, they, they really introduced uncertainty. They introduced uncertainty. We, thankfully, there weren't more than two lost sections really in the core of the thing, so they didn't hurt us too much. Uh, the thing that hurt us by far the most was that short dimension, 50 microns. You can't get very far in a neuron if you're limited by a 50 micron slab. You really want 200 microns, so you want to, or 300, but to say 200, you want four times as much data, which, you know, if we can do in the first iteration 10 terabuxels, we can certainly do 40 in the next iteration, and that's the plan. You had a question? So is this, this kind of structural imaging is not done at this scale normally or at this resolution or? No. <laughs> in, in all the this, 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 yes, I, I, I should uh, uh, give a more of a background. So. Electron microscopy has been around for 60 plus years, 65 years maybe, uh, 60 years, let's say, uh, in, sorry, 50 years uh, in the brain. So classic studies were in the, the late 50s, early 60s of just the ultrastructure of brain tissue. Fairly soon, people started doing serial section electron microscopy correlating over depth starting out with picture after picture that they put into a flip book and did all sorts of tracing. Uh, but got you know, a really good sense of, of the structure of neurons. The landmark paper in the field was 1987, where they reconstructed, they being Sidney Brenner and colleagues uh, at Cambridge, reconstructed the body, but the, the nervous system of a little worm, C. elegans, with 302 neurons, and in modern terms, that was the C. elegans connectome of the 300 neurons, the several thousand connections. Uh, seven years ago, Winfried Denk published a methods paper. It, sorry, uh, for the past 25 years, uh, there has been um, medium scale electron microscopy. One of the real leaders of that is Kristen Harris, uh, first at Harvard, then at Georgia, now in, uh, in Austin, who's done three dimensional model, you know, three dimensional data, uh, sort of the 10 micron scale, starting out with megabytes, then gigabytes, but not, not at the scale that you can begin to do a network. Seven years ago, Winfried Denk did a, did a really wonderful methods paper just saying Moore's law is going, it's time to do large scale EM. Uh, and so th that started the movement. And I really, one month ago, <laughs> I think are essentially the first two papers in this of science, our paper and his paper of science in the field where people, where we and he uh, had terascale data sets that allowed us to look at networks. So that's the, the very fast history that I should have put in a, in a slide. Thanks for, for asking.
in the, in the previous slide, how do you separate the, the uh, imaging of glial cells from the dendrites? In terms of, because I know the dendrites are sort of like a small percentage in the sea of glial cells. Uh, how do you it's, uh, You're talking about the electron microscopy? Yeah. It's easy. You, you, you'll see. Uh, because in this, and I guess it's important to say, you know, here you can't see anything because it's zoomed out and it's only one section. Here you can't see anything because it's zoomed out and it's just volume rendered. You, you know, it, it's just for fun. Ditto here. It's, it's just really for fun, literally. <laughs> uh, this is too zoomed out to see anything. Now let's continue zooming in, okay? This is a raw data picture, but that's a 10 micron scale bar. So it's a 50 by 50 microns. Um, and this picture would be 10,000 by 10,000 pixels. So there's, not, there's no information there other than a pretty picture. Now let's zoom in. Let's zoom in by a factor of whatever that might be. And you begin to see things, but zoom in all the way. Now we're zooming in all the way. And I'll show you. This looks like nothing, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it isn't nothing. <laughs> it's, uh, let me, I did this in the airplane last night until my batteries ran out. <laughs> uh, that's a big cell. <laughs> uh, you can sort of see that everything on the right is somewhat homogeneous with little speckles. Those speckles actually are ribosomes. Those are the machinery that translates uh, RNA into proteins. So it's really, it's high high resolution. Uh, and that's a, that's a cell. It's receiving a little synapse right there, but I didn't label it. Here's the hardest part next, little axons. The axons can be as narrow as 80 nanometers, w way, way below the resolution of light microscopy. There's one axon, there's another axon, there's another. So it's a, it's a fascicle of a bunch of tiny little axons. But you can see that they're pretty clear when they're cut. Um, at right angles, uh, cut normal to, to the direction that, that, that they're going. Uh, here's a synapse. On the left is the axon. You can probably see little circles in the red thing. Those little circle, circles are vesicles, the uh, excitatory neurotransmitter vesicles. And on the right uh, is the dendrite of the receiving neuron. So that's, the, and uh, I can tell you right now, that is glia. That, that's, that's a glial process. So in 1962, you could have looked at this picture and interpreted it very well. Uh, we have an extra help that's in three dimensions. So if you have any question, you can go up and down and see what it is. And given that we're going all the way from the cell body out through the axons and dendrites, we really know what kind of neuron we, we're doing. We actually know which neuron we're looking at. I found it remarkable that Maybe this is because of the orientation you chose for the, for the image, but remarkable that you're almost normal to all the, the axons. Yeah. In this picture. yeah, well, that's, that's, that's the, the ugly uh, uh, problem, that it's not always almost normal. That looks like it's not. I can look here to find my <laughs> cursor. The, these are uh, almost tangential, probably axons, and then it gets harder. But. In the picture, you showed us some examples of things that are head on. But yeah. It's, it's much messier than in general. Yeah, but you know, it's uh, look here. See, see that that that's very elongated, meaning that it's a glancing blow. But it's very easy to do that. So the question is, when does it, it become truly ambiguous because it's really tangential? And the thinner the section, the easier that is. Jeff Lichtman is pushing thin sections in his beautiful techniques. And so we, we had some problems here. But again, our biggest pro our, by far our biggest problem was we had a short stack <laughs> of, of data. And our second biggest problem was we lost a few sections. And our third problem was true ambiguities. Do you find that these axons run in bundles? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Okay. The last mile is not in bundles. Uh, really? And, and that's an interesting question. You know, we really, this is the first time, so the, the classic second phrase in, in, in anatomy is the gain in brain is mainly in the stain. <laughs> Max Cowan said that, that. And it's true. When did neuroanatomy really start is with Golgi. Uh, 
who could see single neurons, and that was taken by him, and but really by Cajal, to look at the structure of single neurons. This is different. Every neuron is equally labeled. So asking the question of fasciculation of neurons is, you know, sort of neurogeometry is, is, is an obsession of mine that the connectomics is, one reason I don't like connectomics is it, in a way it's so much more. It's, it's the geometry, et cetera. Perhaps, but sometimes bundle, bundles are, are bad because they, they, can, they can braid and then you're, then you're in trouble. So, uh, very quickly, how big are these data sets? Now I am beginning to get concerned. We have half an hour. How, how big are data sets and why bother? Uh, uh, 30 years ago, serial section microscopy was sort of on the one micron scale, but a one micron cube sort of the voxels are not isotropic. They're, say, uh, 5 by 5 by, uh, or by 40 nanometers. If you multiply that out, that gives roughly 10 nanometer isotropic voxels, just for, to make the math easy. So on one micron cube, uh, if there were 10 nanometer voxels, would be 100 cubed, which seems like not very much, but it's a megabyte. And that's why people were doing it 30 years ago. Uh, um, Kristen Harris and others have done beautiful work of assemblies of, of, of synapses. So this is an assemblage of synapses that I won't tell you what it is at the 10 micron scale. And the curse of dimensionality, if you go up by a factor of 10 linear, you go up by a factor of 1,000 in voxels. So, you know, 15 years ago, gigabyte data was fine. Uh, uh, but... <laughs> That's, that's the cell body of the neurons we care about. You're not going to get a network out of a 10 nanometer, sorry, 10 micron cube out of a gigabyte of data. These are our, most of our interesting neurons in a 100 micron cube, and that's roughly a terabyte of data. So uh, it's, it's 10,000 cubed, roughly, a, a terabyte of data. And that's when you're beginning to get into the business of large-scale EM, of connectomics. And that's why it's only happened recently, that you know, now you can buy two terabytes for $82. And, that, and when we were starting, that would be a couple hundred dollars. Um, so we need very big data sets to trace these things. Uh, but we're doing it by hand still, and that's the hard part. And so we can't trace it all. But we, we, we have a question uh, that allowed us to do a, just a little bit of tracing to, to get to an answer. What would be great would be a whole cortical circuit. And this is what, what the whole field is shooting for a cortical, some people call it a column, but really a, a cortical assembly, a millimeter cube, a petabyte. That'll happen, and I'll just talk about that at the end. Uh, this won't happen anytime soon, an exabyte, it's just for a lot of technical reasons, but you know, people are talking about it. A human would be a yottabyte, and, or would be a, a zettabyte. Who knows? <laughs> It'd be a zettabyte. We're not going to do that. Uh, so the, the, each hour of data collection was several thousand images that our friends at Pittsburgh stitched together into a seamless uh, single picture. And they also aligned it in 3D to make these, this three-dimensional data set. Uh, now we have a problem. We have 10 terabytes of image data of brain. We have this much smaller data set in the living brain. And the point was to do functional connectomics. We have to solve the correspondence problem. But it actually, that was the least of our problems. We, our, our wonderful technician, who's you know, so wonderful, she's on the paper. She did it in a couple afternoons, which was essentially looking at uh, Hyun Kim, that is. Uh, essentially looking at the not very big data set from in vivo, getting in the right neighborhood, taking 10 terabytes of EM data, throwing away almost everything, just uh, collapsing it in Z, uh, having undersampling in X and Y. All you can see are the little dots for the cell bodies and the black lines, which are the uh, vessels. And you can see it's just a perfect match. Where I, I, you know, I'm certain that we didn't make any mistakes in attributing one neuron to another. And I'll show you how certain we were. Here is a single electron micrograph. Uh, and you can see the little modeled cell bodies, the nuclei. And the colorization is real colorization from the in vivo experiment. And you can see all the little 
the, the red things are, are our blood vessels from in vivo, and it matches with the white things, which are the plastic embedded blood vessels. The cell bodies match the green, and our lonely image plane for doing function matches up very nicely to the EM uh, uh, data set. This is for people who like, don't even bother with this. This is the physiology data. That, but what's nice is that we have physiology data that belong to these electron, micrograph, electron micrographs of these neurons. And then we can begin to do this by hand, painstakingly, but it's kind of exciting too, uh, tr going through the three-dimensional data set and drawing neurons. And essentially, we were lucky enough to be able to, an to answer this question. Do inhibitory cells get random input from excitatory cells? And the answer was yes. Essentially this, yes, we found convergent input from cells with different visual physiology, different colors, onto inhibitory cells, which we color code here by this blue. So it's random connections, you know, functionally random, at least uh, according, uh, uh, along the, the you know, simple label of different orientations onto inhibitory cells. So it fits with models, you know, there are a lot of neural network models where inhibition is more of a gain control kind of thing rather than participating in the computation itself. So it actually, it's, it's nice that this is turning out to be true. Uh, Why would you use the word random instead of multiple, or multiple types? It's, it's, it's just, uh, yeah, 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 it, it, it's, it, it's, it's, it's what random with respect to one parameter that we're measuring, and, and I like I call it random because I really care about the connections between the excitatory neurons, which are non-random. But no, the, but it, so it's 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 yeah, the connections from excitatory cells to inhibitory cells appears to be random with respect to the preferred orientation of the cells, or independent of the preferred orientation. Agnostic, if, if they could knoss, yeah. if they could, if they could, if they could believe. How many, how many, how many um, inhibitory targets did you look at? A handful. It was not a great like sample. Six to ten or something. Or? Uh, we looked at twenty-two uh, validated. And maybe thirty. Uh, yeah, twenty-two, which are maybe, which which or call it thirty, but those were all convergent, so sixty inputs. And did you find? Did you find they had the same distributional inputs? Yeah, we, we did. So I took out on the airplane the, the the cumulative probability distribution, which looked like it's in the paper. It looked like a straight line, uh, so it, it looked random with respect to the orientation. Uh, I'll get to it soon. So, uh, but. Connectivity to inhibitory neurons. You said it's non-computational. Uh, the the, the Barlow-Foldiak model of like uh, of anti-Hebbian learning in cortex uh, depends upon inhibitory neurons. Yeah. Uh, you know. Part of the computation. I don't want to say I don't believe in that. Uh, you know, I, I I certainly want to say that we have absolutely no idea <laughs> about uh, issues of this flavor. This is the beginning of, there are multiple techniques to do this. There's a beautiful paper that came out two weeks ago in Nature uh, from Tom Mercer Flugel's group in London, uh, looking at similar things. Uh, there are different ways of doing this, uh, but in general we have virtually no data that bears on the relationship between connections and computation the cortex. So this is just the beginning of a field. So functional connectivity is a better cool. word. Um, so you detect an inhibitory cell, you can tell from the visually, or is it from the functionally you see it inhibiting? Or how do you we, know? we know it's an inhibitory cell mor morphologically. We, 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 we just know. Okay. Uh, we, we have some knowledge. Uh, I, 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 you always say something and you think of all the people who <coughs> get mad at you. I just got mad at myself. I, you know, I, I spent 15 years of my life looking at functional connections from thalamus to cortex uh, with a different technique. Uh, uh, you know, before I started doing the imaging and, and showing very precise connections from thalamus to cortex. So, uh, so the field exists, but it was incredibly hard before, and now there are a lot of new techniques that are making it easier, and there's very little in the cortex proper. So, so what is your hypothesis here? When you put these different features together, are you kind of creating a more complex feature that uh, appears in images, or, or is it that it's really a random hashing? Yeah. Like a Let's call it a random process. hashing. Uh, uh, the hypothesis is, you know, it's a very vague model, and I don't believe it in all generality, but it's a good working 
hypothesis model. Uh, and and uh, there's several, it's a controversial field, but uh, the other thesis in my lab recently uh, went down on, on this side of the controversy that the inhibitory cells are much less selective. So in this part of cortex, so it, it, it's, it, you know, nothing is, is ever absolute in biology and it's always in between, but there are a lot of indications that inhibitory, sorry. Is there some sort of a locality that when all of these different features fire and they send a signal to inhibitory cell, yeah. that's because something in a near proximity in the image uh, had all these features, yeah. or is it really across the entire image? It's a it's field that these features appeared. Uh, that's so far beyond what I you know know that it's hard to say. I, I think we're really at the stage that you can make very simple questions, and we have no idea the answer. You know, the simplest question you could ask about cortical neurons is: there a logic to the excitatory connections of neighboring neurons? Uh, and the answer is we have no clue. <laughs> and therefore, I don't really like making, you know, I, I like reading about them and I like sort of talking about models of how the whole thing works. Uh, I'm at this stage, let, let's, let's get some real data because we have models, you know, we have one set of models of inhib inhibition, other sets of models of inhibition. Let's get some real data and we'll decide between models are better, we'll, we'll, we'll make better models. Let, let me get to the next four slides because I'm almost done and then we can talk. Uh, this is really the anatomy, uh, 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 one example of this convergent input of different functional types. Up here we have all of our colored neurons are colored excitatory cells that we knew what they did for a living, in the, partially in the living brain. A red neuron, a green neuron. Uh, um, this is an axon, the axon of the green neuron that we traced. Uh, we being Davi Bach, Wei Li, and Hyun Kim. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll stop pointing. <laughs> uh, traced it. It, it, it made a very tortuous tree, not, not the whole tree because it's so thin, but it, it terminated in a bunch of yellow dots and that's a synapse. That synapse here was onto a blue thing which you could pretty very, very quickly see was an inhibitory dendrite. What they next did was they traced that dendrite back to the cell body which is actually quite easy. And then they went to other neurons uh, doing exactly the same thing. A red neuron to a yellow dot to a, a blue postsynaptic thing where they traced that back to a cell body and said, Eureka, that's the same cell body. Here's an example of convergence of a red cell onto a green cell. And that's the kind of science that wasn't possible before, that, that sort of web, you know, if you want to <laughs> show, the, see the few videos and news hits <laughs> after the paper was out, look for web crawling the brain. We, uh, Davi Bach likes calling it web crawling the brain, and, and, and uh, so we... Put a, made a little video of web crawling the brain, but starting one place, painstakingly going to a connection, jumping that connection, going to another node, and so really going, wandering through the network in a way that wasn't possible before. But what it gave us was this. Uh, this is uh, uh, probably pretty hard to see, but it's uh, the thicket of axons and dendrites from the 10 or 12 cells that we were interested in, and here's the unique thing that, we, that you couldn't have done before, looking at hundreds of the postsynaptic targets. And it's just, a, you know, it's a complete mess in a way, but you have the, uh, the cells we started with and uh, cells that they're all talking to. And here's a little advertisement for people who <laughs> uh, are looking on TV or whatever. If you want to read about this, it, it was in Nature uh, in March. Uh, and the title they put on it was Untangling Neural Nets. And so it's a real tangle. Well, you know, we started, it was started off with this infinite data set that was uninterpretable, of course, on, on the face of it. They traced a tangle of connections from it, but from that tangle of connections, they made a graph. They, you know, this is sort of the, the first many-to-many -many actual wiring diagram of a tiny portion of a cortical network. And it's the cortical network uh, from the viewpoint of the colored cells, little triangles here, 
the colored cells, the functionally characterized cells, and, all, and many of their postsynaptic targets. This is only 300 targets out of tens of thousands of, of targets that we could have traced if we had more data, slightly better data, and algorithms to do this. So it's, it's, we're lucky that we could do some science with the amount of tracing that they could do in several months. This, this graph doesn't really mean anything because there are all these orphan leaf nodes at the end. They're just uh, a, a wire from this orange neuron out to other neurons that we don't know anything else about them, and that, that's uninformative. Uh, but there are some informative things, these circles here, where there are convergences from multiple functionally characterized cells onto postsynaptic targets. And this, this is the convergence graph, the graph uh, where the targets receive convergent inputs. And here's the whole thing. This, this is really, we had just enough for some statistics, but the, the, the more important thing is just the existence proof of that little lonely blue neuron receiving input from red, yellow, blue, and green neurons that, that responded to different orientations. A similar thing there. Here's an example of, of green cells converging onto uh, targets. And there are two parts of the story that, of course, if it's random, there'll be, uh, it should be a flat distribution. Uh, so, in fact, you'd expect things that look like this, that look lawful. But also, these neurons lived, were, were near each other, and there's also a, 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 a proximity rule. So, uh, I took, last, literally last night, I took out the, the statistics, but you can look in the paper for the statistics. Sorry. It looks random with respect to sorry, sorry. this function. Or, I thought the, the crawl was the, the, the algorithm was starting at the inhibitory neurons. No, no. It was not. Yeah. So it was starting with the characterized excitatory cells. It's, it's the output graph. It's the projection graph. And we were lucky enough to have multiple hits on common targets from the universe of those 10 cells that, that we traced. So okay. what were the 10 cells you picked? We picked the 10 cells that we had the function. I see. And that's why it was a sad experiment, that we should have had 100 cells with function. We only had 10. OK? So it's nine better than one, which was <laughs> what people could do in the past. But it was only 10. You did find these direct connections, too, it looks like. Yeah. What's that? Yes, you did find the direct connections between. There, there are one or two direct connections between the, those cells. What, um, what do you make of them? There are anecdotes. There are just one or two. So I, I, yeah. Who knows? But they're, not, they're not artifacts. Probably they're almost certainly not artifacts. We, we, we checked them. The, 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 these are things that we checked, but the N of 1. So. Do you know if they're inhibitory or excitatory? No, they're excitatory. So the, these, the, the colored cells, by definition, are excitatory cells. We know, we know they're excitatory cells. So this is the excitatory output graph of functionally characterized cells. And the result is that, that uh, there, here. Here's one example, but the statistics, the, the, the very weak statistics, here's one example of four different colors onto a common <coughs> target. And, but the statistics you know, are, are consistent, cannot reject the null hypothesis of, of random with respect to that. Let me finish the, net, the last four slides, just so I can finish and then uh, what did we have? You know, what, what did we do? We did this really hard experiment to get a result, which it wasn't the, the biggest headline in, in neuroscience recently. But you know, it, the, the techniques are new enough and really promising enough that you know, the world paid attention. What we had, because of the timid physiology experiment, we had sparse physiology. So th this is a, a ring of excitatory cells. The, the triangles are excitatory cells and uh, a bit of the network that we reconstructed. We had a small number of excitatory cells that uh, the exciting thing was that they had different colors, they had different functions. And we uh, looked at their projections onto their neighborhood. And what we got were a bunch of lines like this, red cells onto purple cells where purple is just an excitatory cell, but we don't know what it did for a living. And the next experiment, we will. I'll go through it. Uh, so we really couldn't answer the prime question, red to red, green to green. But we could answer this question, or we could address it. You know, it's the, the, the power wasn't strong. It was consistent with this hypothesis. 
that inhibitory targets received mixed input. But certainly, to, to prove a, a negative, you need a lot of data to do with any power. Uh, we could address this simple question about excitatory to inhibitory convergence. What happens if we do more anatomy? We only, did, we only were able to look at 300 connections out of the tens of thousands from even those 10 cells. And two reasons. One, it's very slow, but the other, we, even if we could have done it infinitely fast, we ran out of axon because we had the thin section. Imagine having twice the data or four times as much data. We could have a pretty rich graph. If we didn't have very much physiology, the graph would be mostly between purple neurons. But we could look at motifs. We could look at, so this is a sort of a graph theoretic entity. Are, are there higher order statistics? Are there, are there things in the graph that have structure? And that's what connectomics could be about. It could be about what is, you know, the, the silliest thing to say is, you know, small worlds networks, but, you know, there are different flavors of questions from graph theory, from network theory, that, that one really would like to know what is a cortical network. Are there cliques? Are there, or is it a, a cliques that you can parameterize in one, two, five dimensions of, of different parameters, maybe different features, et cetera? Another better experiment we could have done is if we had function from all of the neurons, even if with a small number of wires, if we knew the color of the postsynaptic cells, we could have, in this experiment, answered the question we wanted to answer. Uh, just with these three wires, uh, and you imagine having only 20 of these wires, if they were all like to like, that would be statistically significant. So just with a few wires with a lot of function, we can do a good experiment. And, and that's what we're, you know, we're gearing up to do right now with you know, next generation, faster camera, genetically encoded calcium indicators, better, better imaging. So you can ask if there are rules uh, or not. And you know, it's still very controversial. This is obviously what we want to do. A lot of wiring, a lot of physiology, and we can get the rules, red to red, but we can get rules and motifs. And that, that's really what interests me, that you know, what is the, the topology of the network? You know, what, what are the uh, first order and higher order statistical rules of connectivity? You know, is it uh, random or highly structured? And how does that structure relate to function? And very last slide, uh, again, you know, so it's, uh, I've shown this a bunch of times, colored neurons, neurons that we know the function of, but really in, in, in the current generation, it's not just the, the simple function, it's, it's, it's the very detailed visual physiology, and also the firing patterns of neurons that fire together, which uh, uh, I know interests Eric uh, uh, much, you know, quite, quite a, a bit. Uh, inferring the, the structure of a network from the concerted or not concerted firing of a bunch of neurons. And we're, we're getting that, that from the physiology alone, but wouldn't it be great to have uh, the inferred uh, cliques or the inferred dynamical, sub-dynamical systems or something, and actually seeing the wires uh, uh, between those neurons. So what we have now is we, we have uh, 10 neurons uh, that we started with, a graph from the uh, viewpoint of 10 neurons onto some number of tens, maybe more than 100 potential targets, you know, 300 connections with 10 teravoxels. And with that, we could do a very simple question about excitatory to inhibitory circuits. You know, right now we're doing an experiment where we're going to have hundreds of neurons with function, and therefore we're going to look at the network with respect to hundreds of input neurons, hundreds of output neurons, and, and perhaps uh, thousands of connections, and therefore thousands of target neurons. And that's something I think we can do with current technology, and on the order of 50, 100 terabytes of data. So, you know, so we can manage the data. We may be able to manage the segmentation. This is the, you know, what, what do I think we can do pretty soon, pretty soon being five years, in which we'll bleed into 10? A petavoxel. Uh, um, 10 to the 15 data points, which uh, you know, in this business you very uh, well internalize 10 and a half days for a million seconds of that at, at 
110, 105 megahertz, that's 10 terabytes a day, 100 days is a petabyte. So you can collect a petabyte of data, you can store it for not too much money, uh, you can image thousands of neurons with function. Here's the important number, and this is where the, the, the real computer scientists <laughs> need to help us. 10 to the 6 or many more connections. No human being is going to segment the data uh, to, to uh, serially target uh, 10 to the 6 items. We've put the data up online in two places. Uh, openconnectomeproject.org. I hope Microsoft might be interested in, in the same thing. So openconnectomeproject.org. And the, the software actually allows people to crowdsource both the, both the segmentation, but they're calling it alg sourcing. They're, they're asking people to send plugins to do the segmentation. Uh, but this is where we need, you know, a little bit of crowdsourcing of, of the, the work or mechanical tricking of the work, but we certainly need computer scientists to do the 3D image segmentation to allow us to do real kind of comics, which you know, before you really get into to the real structure of cortical networks is the millions of connections. So I think I'll stop there. Thanks.